The millennials and, and Generation Z, uh, they're going to be the majority of the renters over the next decade. Uh, and these cohorts are going to be more focused on environmental aspects of the development, how green it is, what carbon impact does it have, and so on. But they're also going to want to know about the social side. What did the scheme do when it was being developed and what it, does it continue to do in the operational phase and when it's in use? And if they don't like what they see, they'll go somewhere that more fits in with their view of the world. These customers are very savvy. Uh, and if you're not authentic in your approach to, to that, they'll see right through it from a mile away and, and, and go somewhere else. So as, you know, as I mentioned earlier, the buildings that are more environmentally friendly and those with greater positive social impacts are going to see higher occupancy and as a result, higher rental growth and, and better performance. That was Ben Pyle head of European Residential Investing and Asset Management for Barings Real Estate. And this is Streaming Income, a podcast from Barings. I'm your host, Greg Campion, and today we're talking about the growing opportunity in UK and European residential real estate. My guest today is Ben Pyle. Ben joined Barings Real Estate in 2021 to head up the group's residential investing and asset management efforts in the UK and continental Europe. For joining the firm, Ben spent the last decade plus investing in and managing various initiatives in the living sector, most recently with Apache Capital Partners, where he led the social infrastructure investment platform, and before that with ING Real Estate. In this conversation, Ben and I discuss the current backdrop for residential real estate, including the size of the market opportunity in Europe and the current state of institutional investing in the space. We also talk about what's attracting investors today, including dynamics around filling the so-called retail gap in portfolios, along with the potential to achieve diversification and inflation protection. Finally, we discuss where opportunities exist today by region and property type and how ESG is heavily influencing the actions of key players in this space. So with that, please enjoy this conversation with Ben Pyle. All right, Ben Pyle, welcome to the Streaming Income Podcast. Hi, Greg. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to have you. Uh, Excited to uh, dive in on uh, the residential real estate market in Europe and specifically the UK. Um, It sounds like there's quite an opportunity here. It sounds like the asset class may be positioned well uh, versus some of the big macro forces that we're seeing. So I want to dive into that. Um, But maybe before we get into some of the specifics, can you kind of help paint a picture for our listeners, just give them an overall kind of sense of, you know, how big is this market and, and kind of what is it comprised of when you think of, uh, some of the sub segments? Sure. So, globally, residential investment is about $258 trillion in value, and that uh, compares to $68 trillion in commercial property. Um, and uh, you know, the residential investment market's worth more than the equity and bond markets combined, which I'm not sure everybody appreciates. Uh, in Europe, um, last year, there was about 100 billion euros transacted, um, 18 billion euros in Q1 of this year. Um, so it's it's really big business um, across the globe. And um, the UK has accounted for about 26% of that business um, over over the first quarter, um, followed by Germany and Sweden. So there's, uh, there are some big differences in terms of the, the markets across Europe. Uh, the German and Dutch multifamily markets are well established. They've largely concentrated on uh, lower amenity um, schemes, so more of a low mid price point, but they are very institutionalized markets where large investors have driven the cap rates to pretty low levels. Compares to uh, markets such as Italy, um, which has only seen 700 million uh, invested uh, to date, so it's really only just starting. Bearings has recently just closed our first deal in in that country in the multifamily space, uh, so we're excited to to be um, working there. Uh, and the UK is somewhere in the middle with its multifamily housing or built to rent, as we like to call it, really getting a, going over the last decade and accelerating in, over the last five to six years. In terms of the, uh, the sub segments, um, there's really the main ones are purpose built student accommodation, built to rent multifamily, built to rent single family housing, which is getting going in the UK now, seniors housing and co living. Purpose built student accommodation has been at the forefront of institutionalization of the bed sectors. Um, following its birth in the UK in the 1990s. 
uh, accelerated in the in the 2000s and has enjoyed further success since the financial crisis in 2010. And it's attracted that capital because it saw positive rental growth throughout the downturn, which, which uh, no other sector saw in the UK. Uh, in terms of continental Europe, Spain is probably most closely following the UK on that journey um, with you know, well-developed um, built-to-rent and, and student markets. Uh, and and you know, across the, the sub-sectors, we're, uh, we're seeing the most uh, activity in the UK in student accommodation and, and built-to-rent multifamily. Got it. Got it. I, I'm not sure I had fully appreciated the, the overall size of this market and, uh, you know, being larger than public equity and bond markets. Um, now, curious about the kind of institutional investing behavior in the space. You know, you mentioned that there's some differences, you know, certainly based on uh, country, uh, maybe based on, you know, what segment of the market we're talking about. But what's that kind of looked like over time? And it, has something changed recently that's, you know, encouraging more institutional investment in this space? Yes, yeah, so there's been some, you know, differences across across Europe um, uh, in terms of uh, the different approaches in different countries. Large pension funds and investment houses have driven the markets in places like Germany and, and the Netherlands on a different model than we've seen in, in people doing in the UK. And Italy in, uh, has seen uh, very little um, investment. In terms of the UK, there's been very little institutional investment in the UK. Uh, in the 1970s, the government brought in rent controls and that put off institutional investment into the sector for, for a generation. Um, but as I say, it's, it's, it's been getting going over the last 10 years or so. The other thing that uh, meant that investors concentrated on other areas in the UK was the commercial lease structures that we have uh, historically seen in the UK markets. Uh, generally, those were long leases of 20, 25 years. They had five yearly upward only rent reviews. So they provided strong, stable income streams for investors. But in recent years, the lease lengths have, have been getting shorter and shorter, and the average lease length is now you know, under 10 years, and those upward-only rent reviews are now increasingly rare. Um, so institutions have been looking to invest in, in other sectors uh, and build to rent, although it's increasing in popularity, is still very much in its infancy, um, with larger operators such as Granger, who've, who've been going for 10, 20 years, who developing a purpose-built built-to-rent schemes more recently, but a majority of their 9,000 units that they own are, are housing units that they've gathered over a longer period of time. So it's a very different model to, to what we're really talking about and looking at um, here. That, that compares to you know, the US uh, investment market where there are operators and owners who have tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of, of units. And then, so if you think about, you know, we've obviously just gone through, you know, two years of the pandemic, hopefully the worst of it is behind us, but how, how is, how is this kind of sector, you know, fared throughout that downturn? Obviously we've seen tons of headlines around, you know, the office space, but you know, then we, we've kind of got this kind of structural headwinds facing the retail segment of the market. So if you think about, you know, broad brush strokes, looking at the residential space, kind of how has it been performing in the face of some of these trends? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. More recently, there have been increasing numbers of owners who have um, come into the space who are now active, uh, developing and operating. Uh, the likes of um, Get Living, which is a Delancey Qatari DR back venture, uh, uh, who are operating thousands of units across London. Uh, their principal holding is in the Olympic Village, which was uh, repurposed after the 2012 Games here in in London. Um, other Operator developers active in London include Quintain, who have a large holding around Wembley, the national football stadium in the northwest of the city. Then there's also Canary Wharf Group, who have a couple of thousand units around uh, around the office space to the east of the city of London. Uh, then we've got other investment houses such as LNG and M&G, uh, who are active in the space with a, a few thousand units. And um, then there are other developers who have significant pipelines, um, but have only started delivering that, such as Moda, who have a pipeline of six to 7,000 units around the UK, including regional cities, um, but have opened two schemes, one in Manchester and one in Liverpool. And then there are other US uh, groups who have come over, such as Greystar and Cortland, who are also active in the, in the UK market. Um, I think part of the attraction that has uh, driven these these changes has been what's happened in the retail market. Um, retail historically is seen as a safe place to invest money, um, but over time and as has, has been well publicised, um, it's been increasingly difficult for for operators of bricks and mortar retail to compete with the internet. So that sector's had its challenges, and that was exacerbated by the pandemic that we've had over the last couple of years. 
Uh, so increasingly, investors have looked for alternatives to fill that that gap. Now they're not investing in retail uh, and wanting long term income streams um, that residential investment um, can offer. Now you mentioned upfront sort of the diversity of this you know s- sector overall. So obviously, there's a lot of different um, property types within residential. So is the diversification that's available, I guess, both within residential and you know adding residential to a broader real estate portfolio? Is that part of the attraction here as well? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. For um, uh, multi-asset investors. Um, real estate offers some real diversification benefits. Um, in terms of US equities to European real estate, the correlation is pretty low. It's like a, a 0.33. Um, so there's there's some real um, benefits there. And generally, the real estate markets have a low correlation with, with equities and bonds. Um, for a, a given uh, 1% of return, the volatility um, will be a quarter of what it is in, in equity stocks and half what it is in bonds. And so you're getting a an attractive level of return, um, but um, at a much lower volatility. Um, and residential uh, volatility is lower than all property as well. So so it's adding um, that diversification benefit and and also that um, attractive risk adjusted return. Okay, so it sounds like the residential space has you know quite a few characteristics of it that you know could be attractive, especially at this point in the cycle. You mentioned some of the low correlations. You mentioned the inflation protection, the diversification, which we've mentioned a couple times now. So certainly some attractive characteristics. Now, if you think about the supply demand picture, I know you and the team have been looking you know specifically at some opportunities in the UK recently. Talk to me about the the supply demand picture. Are there are there specific areas that you see as undersupplied, and is that therefore creating an opportunity? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, just in terms of the the big picture in the UK, um, in terms of built rent units delivered to date, there have been seventy thousand units delivered so far. Uh, there's forty thousand uh, in development, and another ninety nine thousand in the pipeline. So about two hundred ten thousand in total. So we're really, really scratching the surface of where the market uh, can go in in terms of the UK. In terms of the demand side, you know, we've seen huge increase in the number of renters, uh, and that's forecast to to increase. Um, and that comes back to an affordability point, which we can we can come on to. Um, in terms of the supply, you know, there are very few cities that have had um, a significant scale of development. Um, Regionally, Manchester has seen the most um, delivered to date. There's about there's about eight thousand units up and running, another four thousand in the pipeline. And um, when you compare that to the overall rental market in that city, uh, built rents only providing to about twenty five percent of the total rental market. That's a relatively low penetration rate. So there's there's still significant growth from that point. You've still ultimately, though, of course, still got to be in the right places and offering the right um, the right price to to fill the schemes. Um, but all the schemes that have been finished in uh, Manchester and and leased up have performed very well. Um, after Manchester, um, Birmingham and Leeds have attracted the most capital. Uh, and as a business, we are looking closely at, at both of those markets. Um, but there are a number of other cities and towns around the UK where there's been very little delivered to date, such as Bristol in Western England, um, which is just one and a half hours from London on the train. Um, we recently closed a deal there along a, uh, alongside best in class a developer called Socius uh, to bring forward a 243 unit built rent scheme in a great location near the city centre and the, and the main train station, uh, alongside a best in class sustainable office development of about 150,000 square feet. You know, despite the, the attractions of Bristol, you know, it's got a, a big demand pool, a relatively young market um, who, who would be suitable for the, for the built rent um, um, offer. Uh, it's only seen about 1,000 units delivered, and that's partly down to a shortage of sites and a tough planning regime in the city. Um, so achieving planning for these schemes is not necessarily straightforward. Um, so there's there's been very little um, supply delivered into that market. Um, so we see it pretty much wide open for for new schemes to come in and meet that demand in that city. So it's a it's a it's a very attractive market, and there are a number of markets that we're that we're looking at in the UK that meet those sort of um, um, parameters. Now you mentioned uh, the affordability point being a, a driver here for, on the demand side. Can you tell me a little bit more about that? Sure. Yeah, that's. I mean, it's been a key issue in the UK for for twenty years and uh, or so now, and has, has, was exacerbated by the by the global financial crisis. Um, fundamentally, the UK just hasn't built enough housing in the right locations where the where the jobs are. 
and that shortage of supply has driven house prices to decouple from salary multiples. Um, yeah, historically, those were three and a half to five times salary um, averages, depending on where you were in the country. Um, so that they were more affordable. You could get mortgages to buy at those levels. Um, but in more expensive parts of the countries, a country, we've seen those increase to 10 times, 12 times, and even higher, the average salary levels. And that's made it very challenging for, for people to buy uh, in the market. Um, and as I say, you know, the global financial crisis accelerated that issue um, from two directions, really. Uh, years of cheap money and low interest rates allowed people to drive house prices higher um, because the people who could get mortgages, their overall expenditure on the mortgage interest payments was was lower as a proportion of their overall income. Um, but the the flip side of that was it, uh, the qualification for mortgages was was made more stringent from on a, from a bank lending perspective, and um, for the average person in the UK on the average salary, it takes eight to nine years for them to save a deposit to buy the average house. Uh, and with the cost of living crisis that we're seeing at the moment, that's only going to get worse, not not better. So you've got a huge quantity of people now who are who are being pushed into the the rental market rather than um, being able to buy. You know, when surveyed, 86% of people still say they would want to buy, uh, but that's increasingly becoming a bit of a pipe dream for, for the younger generations. Okay, that's that's helpful context. So it seems like there's, um, for the foreseeable future, any, anyhow, there's a lot of demand underpinning that need for, for rental properties. Um, I, I'm curious, as you think about you know filling that demand, is it more of a focus on developing new properties or is it repositioning older properties or is it some combination of the two? Yeah, I think there's a, there's an opportunity for both. Um, building a new building uh, requires a new concrete frame or a steel frame. Um, it's very carbon intensive, um, so there's an argument for repurposing older buildings that are no longer fit for for the original purpose. Uh, for example, in one of our strategies, um, we acquired the Keel in Liverpool, um, which was a an office used by the um, government's tax office here in the UK, um, which was redeveloped into a built-to-rent scheme in 2018. And that's a really efficient way to repurpose a building without just demolishing it and and building from scratch. Um, We're also converting an office building in Brighton on the south coast of England into a 183-bed student scheme. And this clearly reduces the amount of CO2 produced in, in development, though the analysis uh, does need to include the operation of the scheme and undoubtedly a new build um, will perform better over time and have a, um, it's the fabric of the building will be more energy efficient. Uh, you can more easily build in you know, renewable energy sources than on a, a repurposed building. So it, doing the analysis, you know, it's not a straightforward answer one way or the other. But of course, you know, starting from a, a clean sheet of paper, uh, you can design the communal spaces in a scheme and the apartments um, and optimize them, whereas you might always be making slight accommodations for the for the repurposed building. Uh, and a newer building, you're more likely to create something that positively impacts on its surroundings than an older building that's being repurposed. Hmm. Okay, well, this kind of starts to feed into how you and the team are looking at all this through an ESG lens. So I'm, I'm curious, as you think about residential real estate specifically. I mean, you mentioned, you know, thinking about carbon intensity, uh, thinking about renewable energy sources. Um, t- tell me just overall, like how you're looking at this space through that ESG lens. Yeah, we see residential um, built to rent lending itself very well to the ESG criteria that's at the top of the agenda for, for bearings, uh, as it was with many institutions, of course. The environmental benefits we've briefly touched on already uh, from including energy uh, efficient heating systems and using renewable energy uh, uh, sources on site, such as solar panels and air and ground source heat pumps. Uh, at the Keel scheme I just mentioned, we are looking at putting in place a water source heat pump because it's by the river in, in the city. Um, and that will radically reduce the amount of carbon that the scheme uses um, um, through the gas required to heat the uh, heat the water uh, for the central heating systems. Other environmental considerations include low flow showers and taps to cr- decrease water usage on site, using grey water harvesting um, for watering the landscape areas, limiting use of plastic on site. So the list um, the list goes on. Uh, for the residential, we stretch our environmental targets to future proof as far as possible, because I think in the future investors that we eventually sell to will require that as a, as a starting point. And I think buildings that don't have that will be downvalued and underperform the wider market. 
Okay, so Ben, um, as we as we look forward here, and we kind of zoom out, and we look at this the residential real estate space, and we look at how well it's positioned versus some of the major macro forces um, that that we're experiencing right now. So I'm thinking about things like, you know, all the public market volatility that we're seeing. I'm thinking about, you know, obviously inflation, which we've mentioned once or twice, rising rates, and of course the potential um, for a recession uh, at some point, um, you know, down the line here. Uh, how how do you think that this segment of the market is kind of positioned against this kind of macro backdrop? Yeah, I think it's 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 very well positioned to to cope with some of the market issues that we're now seeing. Ultimately, it provides long term income streams. There's you know, there's an element of non discretionary spend. Everybody has to to live somewhere. Rents after the GFC were were more stable than than sale prices in in build to sell product. Um, as we've mentioned, there's a good level of inflation protection over the longer term from re- residential investment and, and residential rents. Um, and that, that links really comes through um, earnings growth and house prices, though we think there's going to be a, a technical recession in the UK um, at the end of the year. We think longer term residential market will perform um, well compared to, to the other commercial sectors. Got it. So last question for you, Ben, you know, for an investor who's investing in the space might be considering an allocation to this space. Curious, uh, you know, if you have any parting thoughts for them that you might want to share. Yeah, I think it's important to to realize in the residential space, the old landlord and tenant relationship is is basically out the window. Uh, now, residential is very much seen as a, a service and the end customer expects a quality service from the providers as a result. The operator, therefore, is, is they're a key part of the, the equation, and you, you've got to get that offer right. Uh, otherwise, the customers will vote with their feet and um, won't stay around for very long. I think it's also worth saying that the millennials and, and Generation Z, uh, they're going to be the majority of the renters over the next decade. Uh, and these cohorts are going to be more focused on environmental aspects of the development, how green it is, what carbon impact does it have, and so on. But they're also going to want to know about the social side. What did the scheme do when it was being developed and what it, does it continue to do in the operational phase and when it's in use? And if they don't like what they see, they'll go somewhere that more fits in with their view of the world. These customers are very savvy. Uh, and if you're not authentic in your approach to, to that, they'll see right through it from a mile away and, and, and go somewhere else. So as, you know, as I mentioned earlier, the buildings that are more environmentally friendly and those with greater positive social impacts are going to see higher occupancy and as a result, higher rental growth and, and better performance. Uh, and, and finally, I think you know, going back to the more broad sort of European residential real estate approach, you know, countries have their own individual characteristics and having a local partner who understands these is important to success. And this is one of the strengths of the Bearings platform. We've got nine offices in seven countries across Europe. So we're well placed to advise investors in multiple jurisdictions uh, in, in those countries uh, and across the exciting range of residential sub sectors that exist. Yeah, that's great. Thank, thank you, Ben. Appreciate that. I love that point around the the residential real estate um, more as a service and, and kind of thinking about what the next um, upcoming generations are really going to demand um, uh, of that service. I think that's a really great point. Um, well, Ben, this has been great. I've learned a lot. Hopefully, our listeners have as well. Um, so, thanks so much for joining us. Appreciate it. Uh, it's been a pleasure, Greg. Thank you. Thanks for listening to episode number nine of season six of Streaming Income. If you'd like to stay up to date on our latest thoughts on asset classes ranging from high yield and private credit to real estate and emerging markets, please make sure to follow us and leave a review on your favorite podcast platform. We're on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and more. We publish a new episode every other week. And if you have specific feedback, you can email us at podcast at bearings.com. That's podcast at B-A-R-I-N-G-S.com. Thanks again for listening and see you next time.